Thank you for staying with us. Now, Nigeria's former Vice President Atiku Abubakar has advised President Muhammad Buhari on the country's best way out of its present economic situation after slashing the budget by 0.6%. The Presidential Committee on the Impact of the Coronavirus on Nigeria's Economy had earlier disclosed that the economy is facing serious challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I am being joined by Dr. Chateau Lu, a political scientist via phone, and also Golaon Olojede, an economist via Skype. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on the show tonight. Good evening. Uh, Golaon, good evening to you. Are you there? All right, Dr. Chateau, I'm going to start with you. Following Ateko's tweets that the former pre presidential running mate to the current president had in a summary called for a reduction in the cost of governance, he aligned the amount earmarked for the renovation of the National Assembly, cost of feeding for the presidency, among others. Share your thoughts on this and on his recommendations. Well, the, it, it is not a new issue. The, the, it's been a recurring, there's been recurring argument to reduce the cost of government. I'd rather call it the cost of government. Okay. It is not the cost of governance. Because as a political scientist, there's a wider meaning to governance. Governance presupposes power relations. It actually presupposes social service delivery, etc. But in this in this respect, we're discussing. We're actually referring to, as Iku is referring to, the cost of running the institutions of government, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the ministries and departments, and extra ministerial departments, etc. You know, it is, it is not a new issue. It's always been there, and it is a contentious issue that that. The, the, the cost of running government in Nigeria is excessive. I, I'm sure you're familiar with this argument that about 75%, you know, of the current expenditure is appropriated and expropriated, you know, uh, expropriated for the institutions of government. And it does not create a window for capital projects, for capital expenditure, etc. You'll also recall that the Orosoye report. Uh, uh, and, to, and to the extent of the white paper issued recently by the Buhari administration, it, it agreed that the, M the ministry departments and agencies should be, should be merged in some respect. Some should be disbanded, et cetera, with the view to reducing the cost of government. You know, the, the cost is huge. The, you know, the, the financial outlay on the ministries and departments and agencies and staff salaries and the monuments are certainly huge. And, and Nigeria is not likely to be able to sustain this cost, you know, with the shrinking economy, with the whole base economy that is constantly encountering, uh, you know, crisis, price fluctuation, et cetera, et cetera. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it that Nigeria will need to rethink the size of government. Okay, well, it, it, yes, well, it, I, it, I need your no thoughts on that, on Buhari's um, articles, advice to President Mohamed Buhari and saying the cost of running government in Nigeria should be cut down, it should cut down expenditure. How do you react to this tweet from um, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar? Um, I, I read a tweet, um, but I think it broke it further down beyond the uh, blanket uh, 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 caption. He broke it down by saying, look, let's call the fat from the political appointees, but leave the civil servants alone. So you have a lot of fat with political appointees. You have the National Assembly as well, who are elected officials. They're between those people and the presidency itself, you know, there's a vice president office, there's a president's office, there are budgets for feeding that are bogus. There are aircraft management of, of I mean, the, the, the cost of managing the fleet of the presidency and all those things. In the real sense, Atiku is making sense. We need to show examples. And a, a very good way to show examples is to cut those facts. We don't need those facts at this time. And when the people see that you are making sacrifice, it becomes easy to motivate them to get them on board with you. But as long as we have uh, the kind of jumbo salaries that we have been told the, the National Assembly earns, we have wastages like uh, refurbishment of, uh, of, uh, of the National Assembly building. That I think it was 37. Maybe if I just said it downward, no, I, I, can't, I, I don't know. 
those kind of things need to go down. The number of aircraft that was said, you know, this administration promise was going to cut those aircraft down. I don't think anything has happened. Yeah. Then all these entertainment that are huge in all those places, we need to cut them down. All right. But now, well, all, yes, it, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer yeah, yeah, that yes. a focus on human capital development would actually save the nation from further future economic degradation. Does the revised budget reflect a deliberate act towards this? Would you say it does? The revised budget is just an attempt, in a, in a way, to still sustain our expenditure. We, we have to be honest with ourselves. The total budget of Nigeria at around about $10 trillion is paltry. It gets complicated by the fact that we might actually be in recession already. When you are in a recession, your aim should not be to cut expenditure. You actually need to spend but what you can do is remove from those areas of wastages that we have mentioned, all those constituency projects and all those funny, funny stuff, and move it into the area that you are talking about. So we can move things from, cut the fat from those wastage areas and put it, and put those money in areas of uh, human development, area of healthcare, and, and, and those things that will help us to ensure we continue to spend while at the same time we are developing the economy. Now, Dr. Shete, another silent point that was raised was the issue of diversifying the economy. Do you think the dual heat of the pandemic in the health sector and, and the shrinking petrol dollar, which is money made from crude, is going to serve as a wake-up call for the government? Well, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not certain. This government is, um, is it fundamentally is not different from previous governments. You know, uh, the, the, the political class will always make campaign promises, will always talk to the gallery and, and make promises that will not likely be implemented, etc., etc. But when it gets to real politics, when it gets to real governance, you know, the political class and the fraction fails to deliver on social service and social provisioning and uh, governance, etc., etc. Do you know what? Diversification of the economy is not a new issue. We have read this in the literature for decades, and yet the political class has failed to, 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 to diversify the economic base of, of, you know, of Nigeria's economy. You, know? you, recall that, you recall that several other economies that, that were dependent on oil, that had learned to develop massive infrastructure, had learned to develop tourism sector with a view to developing alternative revenue sources for the economies. You know, but beyond it, you know, I, I prefer we think beyond the budget. I prefer we think beyond diversification, etc. We should rethink Nigeria's economic policy. I mean, we should rethink Nigeria's economic philosophy. You will appreciate that the economic philosophy of the Nigerian state is predicated on neoliberalism and, um, and, and liberalization within the context of IMF World Bank paradigms. These paradigms had failed you know, in developing and peripheral societies. All right, the, this, this paradigms are impoverished and alienated, you know, and popularized, you know, the working people and the Bampo and the peasants, you know, in several countries. We need a new economic philosophy that is based on human development, that prioritizes human development, that, that, that substitutes abstract, you know, growth for real macroeconomic development, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. You know, all right now, well, all, a 0.6 percent reduction in an already early budget of about 71 billion is this enough? If you if you ask me, we shouldn't even re, we shouldn't re, be thinking of reducing the budget, we should be thinking of restructuring the budget. The budget, the total 10 trillion, let me let me, I'm, I'm going to be frank with you, 10 trillion expenditure. It's about the size of the educational budget of South Africa, the 10 trillion, the entire thing. So the budget in itself is paltry. So the issue is not to try to reduce it. It is to try to restructure it in a way that when we implement, it will be more effective. It will go to the right sectors of the society and it will change 
We will feel the impact in those places. It's, 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 we can't shrink to get out of a recession. It's, it's not done. We can't do that. So let's look at all those places where there are bogus items. Remove them and reallocate these things to the right segments where we can drive the turbines and deliver the numbers that will help us get out of recession and, and progress as a country. All right, quickly, well, uh, this is you as the economist in the house uh, right now. Could, could you give us a brief summary of Nigeria's economic situation as of today, just so our viewers can understand where the former presidential candidate is actually coming from? Well, uh, the, 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 a, a global view, I mean, from the Nigerian perspective now, is that we might actually be in recession. Recession is a technical term, and it actually requires two quarters before you can say you are in recession. So two quarters of negative, consecutive two quarters of negative growth. We have had one quarter. But from all the events around us, we know that the second quarter will also be a contraction, and that is what is going on around the entire world. So we are in a recession. We have an economy that the central government's total revenue is, is, is horrendous. It, it's, very, it's extremely poor. And that, what, what, what would have helped us would have included states that are more robust. The states are all beggars. Literally, all, like maybe like 80%, 85% of them are beggars. All they rely on is to go to Abuja at the end of every month and go and collect money to come and share. The money they did not work for. This is money coming from the four oil states and some taxes. And that is what they all go there to go and share. You see states that up till today, the total amount of internally generated revenue is 10% of what they spend. What kind of a, a, a state do we have? So the sub-sovereign are not productive. They are, they are machineries for distributing what, is, what they come to take at Abuja. We need to get the turbines turning at those levels so that we can have a lot more to share. As long as the cake remains the same, or as we are right now, the cake is actually shrinking, we are in trouble as a nation. We will continue to beg, we will continue to borrow, and that is how we will continue to live. If oh. we don't have the sub-sovereign performing. All right, finally, Dr. Shetan, apart from reducing expenditure, which we've highlighted is, is a must in government, what else would you suggest the government do in order to save our economy, our already ailing economy as it is? Yeah, well, uh, I, I, would prefer, I would prefer a wider approach. I would prefer a broader and fundamental approach to the economy, but I'm afraid this, this government lacks the capacity, you know, this government lacks the capacity to, to pursue that fair, you know. Uh, one would need, um, the, the state would need to intervene in, in, the, in, in, you know, more concretely in the foreign exchange market, you know. The, the, the government, the state should review interest rate structure, particularly for local industries. Most of the industries are producing are far below industrial capitalization. In fact, the industries are dying. Double digit interest rates is deindustrializing Nigerian economy. It is anti production, it is anti working people. Okay? Thirdly, you know, the, the state should invest in social projects, you know, and to provide social safety nets for the poor and the vulnerable populations in Nigeria. You know, most of the working people and the urban poor and the peasants are vulnerable. To the, to, to, to the unstable, you know, policies, economic policies of the state. And unfortunately, and regrettably, the state is hardly there to protect the poor, to protect workers against currency fluctuation, interest rate fluctuation, you know, inflation increase, et cetera, et cetera. That, 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 that explains my argument earlier, that we had a trajectory. The Nigerian Niger political economy is at a trajectory. And the trajectory is we need to rethink Nigeria's economic philosophy. We have tried liberalism for several years, for decades, you know, and liberalism has failed in several African countries, including Nigeria. We need an interventionist or superintendent state that will play a major role, you know, in the economy, in production and distribution. Oh, I you know, my argument is yeah. that the state 
to coexist with the market. The state should supervise the market. You know, I agree with the earlier speaker that the, the, the size of the budget is paltry. Yes, it is. You know, it, it's it's peanut compared to the size of, of the of the budget of Texas, for instance. It is insignificant for a country that aspires to grow and recall massive development. It should need a lot more, a lot more, a lot more in terms of budget. But right, the Dr. question Sh is, right, how does Nigeria raise the fund? How does Nigeria, we, we need, you know, we have to let finances, you now, Dr. The the, finances the budget? All right. Considering that its economy is lopsided, considering that the economy is peripheral, considering that the economy is subject to fluctuations in the in the, in the international oil market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Dr. Seto Liu, it's been, it's been a pleasure you know, having you join and us and your contribution. I appreciate it. Thank you, you very know. much, Dr. Seto Liu, for joining us on the show tonight. Yeah, my pleasure. And Bolao Lujade, thank you very much also. Your contributions are well appreciated tonight on the show. Thanks for having me. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take our plush report now. And when we return, I'll be giving my take. Stay with us. March the 29th, 2020, President Muhammadu Buhari announced a lockdown in the two states of Lagos and Ogun, and also the federal capital, Abuja. The lockdown was aimed at helping contain and manage the spread of the novel coronavirus. Essential service providers, including security personnel, health workers, and journalists were excluded from the ban on movement as they were expected to work with government as partners in progress. However, journalists who have had to help government pass information, engage with Nigerians on their conduct during the pandemic, have not been so lucky. With the federal government keeping mum on the plans it has for newsmen, while health workers have been given increased welfare packages and already insure a life insurance. Some journalists spoke to Plus TV Africa saying the job has not been without its own peculiar hazards. General absence of personal protective equipment by either government or media owners generally has been a very challenging one for us. Treatment to journalists right now is very unfair, starting from uh, the provision of, of the personal protective gears. Even those journalists who are covering the presidential uh, tax force are not even given. It was only until there was a public outcry and a request by the media that they should boycott that briefing before they deemed it fit to start giving them personal protective care. They're in the forefront of this and the media should have a right of person. They also express their displeasure over the conduct by government and private media owners. The federal government, Mr. Jones, and the health workers as those on essential services. But unfortunately, journalists were exempted from the bonuses or the allowances. We have made the point consistently, and we will continue to do so, that journalists and media workers are entitled to hazard allowance. They are entitled to insurance that is paid for by government or other insurance practitioners. After all the medical research, after all the health procedures, after all the protocols about interaction, social and physical distancing, if the media fails in its duty, what happens? The message amounts to nothing, absolutely nothing. The same way we are having doctors giving special preferential treatments, do you understand the same way journalists should be treated, and any journalist for that matter. Journalists are even being faced with pay cuts. We are seeing pay cuts, we are seeing job cuts, and people are not speaking. We challenge the NBC, challenge the Nigerian Press Council, and the NUJ to speak up for journalists who have lost their jobs and people who are losing their pay. Amadin Uyi. Here's my take. With the 36 state governors under the ages of the Nigerian Governors Forum, the NGF, criticizing and calling for the controversial Control of Infectious Diseases Bill, sponsored by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gbaja Biamila, to be stepped down. My advice to the House of Representatives on the bill is for it to be put forward to a public hearing, where stakeholders' contributions will be sought to make improvements to the bill before it is reviewed and debated by the Committee of the Whole. 
Then from the accumulation of these mirrored views, suggestions and good faith critics from within and outside the House that they should arrive at a final legislation that meets the present future needs of our country and which we all can support in good conscience. Don't forget human rights are fundamental rights and fundamental rights are human rights. For too long, Nigerian rights and African rights have been trampled upon by slavery and colonization. And now Nigerians have made a stand and said clearly no to this bill and will not have their fundamental human rights and the right of consent trampled upon as stated by UNESCO Declaration Article 6. Now, even though I have my doubts as regards the intention of the former presidential candidate of the opposition party, Atiku Abubakar, I have to agree with him. The truth of the matter is that we have been running an expensive democracy for a while now. And for example, Nigeria's expenditure for the year 2019 was budgeted about 8.83 trillion naira, whereas the government's revenue for the same year as December 2019 was just about 938 billion naira. We have operated at a deficit for a while. Now, let's take the time to screen ourselves. Let's reduce spending on things that are not essential. I mean, on a monthly basis, one Nigerian senator collects salary and allowances amounted to about 1.06 million naira, and in a year it runs to almost 13 million naira. Just one senator. So imagine how much we are spending on all of them. I'm not saying these people should not eat the fruit of their labor, if indeed any, they do. I'm saying that we need to be wise in the ways we use our resources, especially now that the oil market is taking a hit from the pandemic. Wisdom, as they say, is profitable to direct. And that's all for tonight, plus politics returns tomorrow, same time. Until then, remember, take care of yourself, stay safe, and be well.